was there from day one, September 17, 1967. I was an eight-year-old boy holding my father's hand, walking outside of Tulane Stadium, looking for tickets for Saints Rams, the debut. My dad was able to procure a couple of standing room only tickets. And we sat in the aisle, two rows from the top of Tulane Stadium, right where the entrance was into the press box door. And we got in in time to watch John Gilliam, who was going from our right to left, just as all the footage is, and we were there to see the 94 yard run back and the Saints begin this franchise in a most amazing way. So I'm, I'm a diehard Saints fan because it's 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 in my it's in my blood. I mean, it's the first it's the first team I ever fell in love with. And then later in life, to be there to call the coronation, the Super Bowl, it was a thrill. It felt like it was meant to be. For me, once we got on the bus and you're heading into the stadium and you walk into that locker room and you get your ankles taped and you're putting your knee pads in your pants. It's the same thing that we've been doing since we were kids. And, and that settled me down. I'm sure I was not the only one of, we've done this. This is just a game of football now. All the circus that we've uh, been a part of and witnessed leading up to this all kind of washed away and now it's about football. During that game, before the game, the this was day of. It was just um, during the national anthem, and just seeing what all goes into this, this one game, this big game. I had a flashback of everything I went through playing football until that moment. Everything, meaning the people doubted me. Uh, all the hard work I put in, schoolwork, teachers, family, you know, working out, all the things I did wrong, all the things I did good, everything. Everything just replayed in my head and the national anthem, you know, just gave me goosebumps. And then when we were done, I was just like, okay, everything, now I just, now I'm in it, <laughs> now let's go. So I think we felt like, you know, the biggest challenge for us is just going to be the start of this game and just, you know, um, handling any adversity that might come our way. And sure enough, you know, they come out, bang, 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 they score 10 points and it's 10 nothing. So you go, all right, let's just let's calm down and realize that this is ju it's just a football game. You know, it's the Super Bowl, but it's just a football game. Do what we know how to do, do how we practice, execute the game plan, we're good. So we get a field goal and then I think they kind of play it safe at the end of the game, or into the half, and we end up stopping them. They punt it to us, and we get in field goal range and kick one going in, which was huge because all of a sudden you go from 10-0 to 10-6. The first, uh, the first one came off my foot flawless. You know, knew it from the second. Uh, actually, I, I thought I got away with the one a little bit right before halftime, um, but it, it stayed true. I felt like, hey, we, we weathered the storm here, and and. Um, you know, we'll settle in and we'll play well in the second half. That's, that's the way I felt. It's a one possession game. And not only one possession, but, you know, touchdown puts you in the lead. And that's when Coach Payton makes the, the call in the locker room at halftime that here comes ambush. He's looking for any advantage. And, and I know that going into the game, one of the things that, that he felt was important is trying to find a way to steal a possession. Um, because you're playing against a really good team. They're not gonna beat themselves. You have to go beat that team. John gave us one of the great secrets of my career that anyone has ever trusted us with was for that game. We were meeting with Sean. It was Thursday leading into the game. He sat at the head of a table like this. I was here, Phil Sims was here. Our producer and director were in the room and our editorial consultant. And Sean looked at us and said at one point, leaned in and said, we're going to onside kick in the game. And I want you to be ready for it. You know, I'd seen us practice the, the, uh, the onside kick um, during the week. And so I knew, I knew he was gonna do it. I just didn't know when. Coach Payton sticks his head into the defensive back huddle and he just goes, hey, we're gonna run ambush. Hey, Roman, this is for you cover it up and just want to let you guys know. And 
for me, it didn't put a lot of pressure on me. I, I wasn't doing anything in, in that, that play. I, I was uh, the guy that looped around just in case the ball popped out. And I know that Coach Sean Payton came up to Coach Mack prior to the Super Bowl as we were preparing for those two weeks and said, we want another possession during the course of this game. What do you think of a, a fake punt? And Mack said, yeah, I'm not really fond of a fake punt right now with the rookie punter, but we have this onside kick that he's been working on. It looks really good. So at halftime, like very, very early in halftime, it was like, all right, we're, we're going to start the second half with this. And that was probably a mistake by me telling Thomas Morstead. I really, at first, I, I looked over at Timo, and you know, he's just sitting there with his helmet on. Uh, <laughs> Poor guy, I don't know if he was hyperventilating, but he, he, he really did look nervous. And I try to make it kind of friendly because we've been working on that for a long time and he had it down to a science. And there was um, really, I know he was gonna be able to execute it. I don't ever take my helmet off. And so uh, it's just a thing. I don't, like to, I don't like to take it off or set it on the bench and put a hat on. I just kind of like to stay locked into the game. And so I don't take my helmet off at halftime either. And I was just sitting in my locker and I was assessing the first half. And then I just remember kind of hearing a roar from the defensive locker room. We got your back, coach, you know. And Coach Payton busts through the doors and he walks right by my locker and just points at me and says, we're running ambush to start second half and passing. So there was not like a chance for a conversation or uh, for me to even have a reaction with him. He just said it as he walked by and that was it. He almost went comatose. <laughs> and so uh, Coach Mack walked up to him several times to speak with him and, and, and Thomas was non-responsive. And so I sat down next to Thomas and just trying to get a good read on him. And I know he was just focused, maybe in a, like a, a meditative state. And I just remember my heart rate immediately just going through the roof and um, I remember being very upset that he told me and I had to wait for 30 minutes. Um, but I'm glad, after the fact, I'm glad he told me that because I did not have a, a you know, positive um, reaction to this. Uh, you know, I wasn't thinking, yeah, let's go for it. I was, I started having kind of some negative thoughts and um, at some point I remember just saying, okay, heck with it. Like, let's think of every negative thing I can. Let's get it out of the system. And the worst thing about a surprise onside kick is you can't practice it, right? So I'm out there just banging kickoffs as hard as I can, just trying to get as much energy out because I'm so amped. And, uh, and um, I even remember telling their punter, Pat McAfee, who was drafted that year, hey, you know, tell your returner not to bother even going out there because I want to hit this out the back of the end zone. You know, I was just, I was selling the Kool-Aid to anybody I could to kind of trick myself mentally. You know, John Carney in, in practice, when we do it, he'd always say, as a reminder, he'd always say, Timo, hit it 10%, you know, basically swing easy. And um, he was the last person that said anything to me. We, so we break the huddle, and he kind of grabbed me and turned me around, and he just looked at me in the eye and said, Timo, 1%. I just remember watching it uh, come off of Thomas's foot, and all of a sudden there was a scrum. It, it, it was, it's, it happened in, a, in just a flash. It's a bit jaw-dropping when somebody tries to pull off a play like that uh, with the stakes that big, and then they do. I'm looping around, I'm, I'm coming behind the line, and once we kick the ball off, and Thomas Morstead hit a great kick. Jonathan Casillas just run, running over and spearing whoever was right there on top of Chris, and I think that allowed Chris to get the ball. Then it was like the longest scrum in the history of ever. All our whole bench was right there, just saying it was, you know, it's white ball, white ball. One of my, my number one visual memory from the Super Bowl, or from that play, was uh, at the end of the movie, remember the Titans when they, they, they win the state championship at the end and they hold the ball up and it's kind of right in the lights. Chris held this ball up and it was right in the lights. And I just remember I hugged him from behind. I was like, I love you, man, you know, thank God he got this ball. Roman kind of couldn't get to it, and, and the Colts didn't back off like we thought they did. And all of a sudden, in a split second, bounces off a Colts player and comes just screaming at me at that moment. And wasn't expecting it, wasn't ready for it. So 
threw my hands and body at it, and as I'm going down, the ball slips in between my arms, in between my legs, and finally, I land on it and pin it against my side, and all of a sudden, everything goes black. And it just feels like a Mack truck is sitting on me because you have so many players trying to get at that ball, and I'm just holding on to it with, for dear life with one arm pinned against my side and, and, and trying to help win the game. And I'm just fighting for the ball in that moment. To me, it showed brilliance on, on Sean's part and his staff to figure out they were going to do this, to know where they were going to do this, exactly which direction to aim it at what player. They, they had that all figured out. Um, to have that kind of confidence in your team and then to see your team react to you because your coach has just empowered you. He's, the coach has empowered you saying, I believe in you guys. You're going to make this play and we're going to go win the game. And uh, it was a, I've, I've been a broadcaster now with seven Super Bowls. I've never seen a play like that in either a game I've called or a game I've watched that took that much guts. The play did what it was intended to do. We stole like one possession from the Colts. So they don't get one and then we get an extra and that's significant. Um, I think almost an hour went by between when Peyton was on the field for his last snap in the second quarter. I mean, a large chunk of time went, went by. So it was, it was really about trying to get an extra possession. They march right down and Sean Payton and players have told the story about how he said, we're gonna get an onside kick, we're gonna take over here, and these are gonna be the first six, eight plays that we script, and we're gonna do this, this, and this, and score. And it's exactly what they did, just as scripted. First and 10 Saints from the 16-yard line of the Colts. Play action, Breeze sets up the screen. Pierre Thomas, Thomas still on his feet, down to the five, makes the move, he's gonna score! 16 yards as Pierre Thomas puts the Saints in the end zone for the first time tonight. Pierre Thomas, screen pass touchdown, which, you know, might be the signature play of the, you know, the Sean Payton, Drew Brees era. Uh, is, is those screen passes with their great offensive linemen and, and Pierre Thomas running down the field. So that was smooth. Then in the fourth quarter, uh, the Saints offense and Drew Brees are in perfect rhythm. He leads them on a touchdown drive to go ahead in this game, completing all eight of his pass attempts to eight different receivers, which is just unthinkable. And that includes the touchdown pass to Jeremy Shockey and the two-point conversion pass to Lance Moore that needed a little help from a replay review. You know, a lot of people caught the ball, a lot of people had touchdowns um, that year, and when you can move the ball like that, you can have so many different targets, so many people open and who are willing to do their job to the best of their ability and, and be where the quarterback needs you to be, that just stresses the defense out because you can't target Marcus Colston, you can't target Lance Moore, you know, Pierre coming out the backfield with the screen, one, two, three people aren't going to bring him down. Um, you have Shockey running whatever route to get open. He's going to catch the rock every time. So, you know, we just had a lot of guys who bought in and believed. He was in complete control. The moment was never too big for him, and he was definitely ready to, on this stage, join the upper echelon of NFL players and become, on that stage, on that day, one of the great players to ever to ever play the position. It was that day. And uh, here, here's one thing I, I remember at 24-17, Saints are leading, Colts are driving, and Peyton's bringing him down the field like he had so many times in his incredible career. And he kept connecting with Reggie Wayne. Manning to Wayne, 12 yards little hook across the middle, first down. Back to Manning, to Wayne, first down. They're motoring down the field. This game is, this game's headed to overtime. There never at that point had been an overtime game in the history of the Super Bowl. But as they were marching down the field, I just knew that Peyton was gonna do what he does and get him to the end zone. Fourth quarter, third and five, you see this formation and uh, Malcolm and I, we, you know, we make eye contact because we know what's what's about to happen, so we naturally just switch guys without letting them know what's going on. When he made that check, it was going to be a comeback, so we had the, the blitz called for 
T Porter to squat on that. And so I checked into the blitz. We checked into the blitz. It was too late for him to check. It was it was like three seconds left on the play clock. It was too late for too late for him to check. So then we got into it. Porter got the call. And again, he was able to squat on that route because he had help over the top. So he squatted on it. And I know if he sees us do any kind of hand signals, he knows what we're gonna do so they could potentially double move us or change the route. So Malcolm and I, we just look at each other and it's kind of just a quick head nod and they try to run that route. He takes my guy that went in motion, I take Reggie Wayne and I step in front of the pass and my first, my first mindset was don't drop it. I mean, you're on the biggest stage of them all. The worst thing you can do is drop it. Tracy Porter steps in front. Boom. Shotgun puts Collie in motion. Looks in his direction. It's picked off. It's picked off. It's Tracy Porter again. He's running free. He's going to go all the way. Hand out stretch. It is a safe touchdown. 70 yards on the return. 70 yards on the return by Porter. He did it to Favre. And now he's done it to Manning. And once I, once I caught the ball, my next mindset was after being trained by Greg and our defense, once you catch your interception, get to the numbers. If you get on the sideline, you don't have that much wiggle room. You get to the numbers, you have a little wiggle room, and your guys will clear the numbers for you. And that was elation right there when, when, when he got that pick and ran it all the way back. Went out, went out to the numbers, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> There's no doubt in my mind that Tracy's uh, methodical film study is what had him um, be in position to make the play that he did. Because if you watch the playback of it, it's like there was already kind of a recognition there. I think he saw uh, as the formation came out or whether there was a motion or whatever it was, it's like he knew, all right, this is the one and I'm about to go and get it. And it was just like clockwork. Got the pick, touchdown. Um, so, you know, that was, that was a good feeling. When you get it right, it's a good feeling. 74 yards later, I'm in the end zone, pointing to the crowd on my way to the end zone. Will makes a great block on Peyton Manning. And you know, we know what, what happens after that. Uh, we, we win it, we bring the Lombardi back home. It felt like that day, it felt like uh, everyone in the stadium was a Saints fan. And I, I, I really believe 90% of the stadium or 85% of the stadium was, but we travel well. And uh, yeah, I, that, at that moment, it was gonna be hard for someone to beat us. You know, Tracy Porter cuts in front. He takes it back, he houses it for a touchdown. We're on the field. It's you know, seconds left in the game. We're giddy like little school kids, and Goody pops me. He's like, Stint, tell it to me again. They're like, we're up by 14, and we're going to win a Super Bowl. Once the clock struck zero, that's when I was like, I can exhale, and everything just started hitting me all at once. It was unbelievable. It was at that moment that I felt everything I had done throughout my life. Um, all the games, all the injuries I went through, all the battles I went through, um, from when I was a little kid, from when I was nine years old, to the first time I, I played a football game. Uh, this is what it was all for. Um, it was all, um, it, was, it was not for nothing, right? It, it was all for a purpose. Uh, it was all, or something special. And one of my high school coaches sent down a flag from my hometown of King George, and I was just roll, just running around the field with that flag, just you know, just kind of representing you know my hometown. Just really, just not really understanding how significant of a deal that was, you know, for me, and my family, and you know, from from where I'm from, you know, my hometown. I mean, that's a big deal. Chaos, it always is, confetti's flying in the air. The Saints are, at that point, as euphoric as any team I've ever been around. And, you know, the presentation went on with Drew holding his son, and uh, I couldn't help but think about being a young kid myself, being with my dad, being back at Tulane Stadium, and seeing this franchise come to life for the first time. I saw a lot of symmetry when I looked at Drew 
to his boy. My father had passed away the previous summer after a long battle with Alzheimer's. He had been gone roughly seven months. This was the first time I would call a Super Bowl since losing my dad. And uh, sometimes we all have these little personal moments that you can't explain. You know, how did I happen to be there the day the Saints became world champions? When I also was there the day the Saints came to life. How does that happen? It was, it was very sweet.